By now you've heard the story of the missionary who was killed by members of a remote island uh, tribe somewhere in the Indian Ocean. And now when I first heard about this story, I asked myself, after all these years, in this day and age, how can a group of people still be so outdated, out there acting like such savages, causing so much harm in the world? And let me clarify, I'm not asking how can there still be Sentinelese tribesmen, I'm asking how can there still be missionaries? In this segment, we're gonna talk about these globetrotting evangelicals and see if missionary work has evolved at all since the days of smallpox blankets. But first, let's talk about this indigenous tribe and the misguided man who unfortunately followed through on the thoroughly bad idea of approaching a group he knew to be violently confrontational toward outsiders. The Sentinelese are one of over a hundred so-called uncontacted tribes in the world. Now, most of these live in South America in places like the Amazon, but the Sentinelese themselves are the only uncontacted tribe in the world to have their own island. And anthropologists believe that they're, uh, they've maintained this same Neolithic lifestyle for anywhere between 30,000 and 55,000 years, which I'm told is a very long time. Nearby islands uh, are home to other indigenous tribes known as the Great Andamanese tribes that have had more interaction with colonialists over the years and have fared much worse. Quote, several epidemics engulf them syphilis, ophthalmia, measles, mumps, influenza, and gonorrhea, which steadily shrank their population from 3,500 in 1858. And by 1931, it was down to 90, which I'm told is a very small number. To be fair, the Sentinelese have had their run-ins with outsiders over the years. In 1880, Officer Maurice Vidal Portman of the British Navy came upon a, quote, elderly couple and four children who they took back to Port Blair, the capital of the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. The elderly couple sickened rapidly because of course they did and they died, and the children were sent back to the island with gifts, which thankfully didn't kill everyone on North Sentinel Island. Now the island has seen a handful of shipwrecks. One, the Primrose, is actually still visible if you go look for it on Google Maps. Everybody marooned on the island has been attacked. Some were killed, including a pair of fishermen who got drunk, floated to the island, only to be uh, shot with arrows in the head multiple times. So there's something for a hangover. What we do know is that they have lived happily and largely healthily on their tiny, lush, mangrove-swamped 20-square-mile island for at least 30,000 years, during which time they have feasted on wild pig, clams, berries, and honey engaged in energetic communal sex sessions on the beach and repelled pretty much every visitor, well-meaning or threatening, with a flurry of poison arrows and razor-sharp machetes. Couple things stick out to me. First, uh, energetic sex sessions on the beach. These people know how to party. Why are we trying to convert them? It looks like we all could learn a thing or two, or 69. Uh, but I'm gonna read between the flurry of poison arrows here and say that they don't like visitors. And for all party safety, the Indian government eventually passed a law prohibiting visitors from getting too close to the island. And that's the way things were until John Chow showed up. Now Chow was two things, an adventurer and a missionary. And while his pretty popular Instagram featured captions like, Kayaking the tropics in this endless summer, hashtag off season, hashtag adventure, hashtag perky jerky. His personal journal said things like, Lord, is this island Satan's last stronghold where none have heard or even had the chance to hear your name? Now, I get mad when people I know judge me. Imagine if a strange missionary showed up and called my homeland Satan's stronghold. Though, to be fair, I do believe Satan's stronghold and missionary both refer to sex positions. Chow had a longtime obsession with the island, so he hired fishermen to take him there. And here was his master plan. Hi, my name is John. I love you and Jesus loves you, he shouted at them. Then he threw a fish at the Sentinelese and fled, end quote. We're off to a great start. The saga continued. He returned the next day with a bevy of gifts, fish, scissors, and a safety pin. When a man wearing a crown shouted at him, he sang worship songs and hymns until the boy shot an arrow that stuck in Chow's waterproof Bible. That's not a foreboding omen. 
Still, Chow later returned to the island because he said, according to him, he just needed to declare Jesus to them and he was never heard from again. Now, I know how I feel about this. I went to a Catholic school, which eventually did find out that the English teacher who was sleeping with the students actually met that student when he, she was in middle school. I mean, I don't think he suffered any consequences and he went on to teach somewhere else. Plus, I also did see The Keepers on Netflix. So with those two things, I'm still a little cynical about organized religion. Also, a LinkedIn profile for that guy says he works at Fresh and Easy, by the way, which I guess is how he likes them. And the only reason I hope there's a hell is so that he burns there. So that's how I feel about organized religion. Of course, that's just me. The real question is, how do current and former actual missionaries feel about John A. Chow? After all, there are 440,000 Christian missionaries going out there doing the good Lord's work in 2018. The New York Times recently asked some of them this very question. One, Mike Wilson had been to missions in Haiti, and he said, quote, I believe if someone is truly called by God to do something, they must do it. Jesus broke with the traditions and taboos of his day to touch lepers. Good point there, Mike. Just one thing, if you touch lepers, nothing happens. If you touch the Sentinelese, they all die from a cold. Why would God call upon you truly to do that? Not everyone's like Mike. Uh, some just go on missions to do nice things. Andrew uh, Millman said, quote, I went through extensive training on cultural competency, post-colonial theory, and faith-rooted organizing. I was not there to, quote, save souls or to convert people, but was instead said to live in solidarity with marginalized communities while working for holistic systemic reform. And honestly, that sounds awesome. This is the healthiest approach I've found. And to be fair, I came across a lot of missionary organizations that follow this model. Go there, do good, build houses, God bless. But one account caught my eye, Amy Peterson, who went to Southeast Asia in the early 2000s. She said, quote, I worked as an English teacher and as she puts it, an undercover missionary in a country where proselytizing was forbidden. Over the last 15 years, I've thought a lot about whether I did good or evil in sharing the gospel with those women. Missionaries like this are teaching people a new language, they're building a school, but they're also just kind of lying. The Atlantic writes, Christian missionaries nowadays are relatively less inclined to tell others about their faith by handing out a translated Bibles and more likely to show it through their work, often a tangible social project, for example, in the context of a humanitarian crisis. That sounds fine, but here's another person interviewed for the article who says, when I'm abroad, I don't say the word missionary because of the stigma that it carries with other communities. I usually just use the word volunteer or English teacher, so it actually sounds like I'm there with a purpose, and I'm not going to make you believe something you don't wanna believe. But you are. You're misrepresenting your true intentions, and the last time I checked the Ten Commandments, that's bearing false witness against your neighbor. Of course, an approach like this can yield strange consequences when you're going out being an American evangelist in foreign lands, uh, as I found in this video of an Indian faith healer doing his best impression of a televangelist using Jesus to help a man's short leg grow to match his long leg. Bone grow, tissues, muscles, ligaments, grow in the name of Jesus. It's just so amazing to see the Bible channel at work in foreign countries. Now, in my line of work, I try to convince people of stuff all the time, but I try to come at them with facts. I certainly don't target people like the Sentinelese or the countless others already decimated or annihilated through germ warfare or actual warfare. The core of missionary work always sounds good. Building schools, teaching a second language, even you know, teaching folks about the fundamental underpinnings of what builds their ethical system through religion. But it's the way that missionary work has been carried out over the years that seems downright evil. That's why there is a stigma around it. The hubris you have to feel to see this tribe not as an absolute miracle, but as a problem to be solved. And to see their untainted paradise as hell instead of Eden. And to see yourself as the savior, not the serpent there to tempt them through a, taking a bite from your fish that you've wiped your fucking bacteria all over. Hi, it's me, Brett. I know you have no way of understanding these words that I'm saying right now, but what if I told you that you'll burn in hell for all eternity unless you eschew your carefully guarded 50,000 year old traditions from mine? 
For God's sake, heathen, replace your savage nudity with something civilized and godly, like this necktie, short sleeve dress shirt combo. Now that your primitive days are behind you, why don't you do something civilized like drink the blood of my zombie god, which is wine, little boy, but it's okay, you can trust me, I'm wearing a robe. Don't take my word for it, just listen to Kenya's first post-colonial president, Jomo Kenyatta, who said, quote, when the missionaries arrived, the Africans had the land and the missionaries had the Bible. They taught us how to pray with our eyes closed. When we opened them, they had the land and we had the Bible. Did you know that TYT Network is now available on YouTube's new streaming platform, YouTube TV? Get access to full TYT episodes and exclusive shows by signing up for YouTube TV today. All new subscribers get a seven day free trial. So head over to youtube.tv and search for the TYT Network channel.